My name is Murray Sexton. I run a small training company. There's just two of us uh, based in Norfolk. And um, we did get involved with the first SMAR project with Erasmus. And that followed up with Be Well and Bev Tour. And now sort of obviously we're not in Europe anymore. So that's the end of those really. Um, and the, the Be Well project was quite pertinent and important to what we're talking about today because originally I was going to run a training course for one member from each of the partners and everybody was going to come to the UK and we was going to spend three days doing it. Um, COVID hit um, and never went back. And so we changed it, opened it up to a lot more people because we didn't have the travel expenses. Um, and then we just had to adapt the course that we were going to offer to create the online experience, I suppose. Um, do you know the difference between online learning, hybrid learning, and blended learning, and even e-learning? Yeah, I could. I don't know the difference, but I can tell you what I think it is. Um, e-learning. If we start with that, that is just an easy way of learning that people can access remotely, um, either through laptop, computer, desktop. Um, dialing into a website or even down to a tablet or on the phone. Um, we sort of look at it really, from my point of view, as multiple guests. It's a really easy way for people to access learning uh, at their own speed, which becomes crucially important at their own time, take their own time working the way through it. Um, and the assessment is done by a series generally of multiple choice questions, um, although some can be in response. Um, which gets marked and scanned. Um, if you get the answer wrong, you can go back and do it again uh, and have another go and have another go until you get the combinations right. Uh, and that's the problem. It doesn't necessarily test your knowledge. It tests your memory or it tests how many times you've got it or how, many, how good your broadband connection is. So when we look at that, that's the e-learning bit. The um, next one you wanted to talk about was your your hybrid learning. What is hybrid okay. learning? Hybrid learning to me is where you pull lots of things together. Blended learning can take place just physically, or it can take a place with a mix of remote uh, like this or and physical as well. Um, and then you have need to figure out how you do the assessment. And sometimes the assessment is defined by the qualification itself uh, and the regulations around that. Hybrid learning, for me, tends to bring in all sorts of different things. So, for example, it could be working your way through workbooks, uh, which then get marked. It could be a little bit of e-learning. It could be a little bit of using links to go and do your own research and then hopefully some physical interaction with a tutor, learner or facilitator, um, which then starts to refine it to actually explore the knowledge that you've taken in, uh, which I think is really, really important, and then expand it out into some form of assessment. So, for example, what we did with the mental health stuff that we're going to do from Be Well was – literally immediately after the the pandemic kicked off and we went into the big sort of worldwide lockdown trying to figure out how that would work and what one organization that we work with came up with was you'd get send out the resources kit to the candidate so i sent carol um a pdf which lists one web one web link a url which takes you to an online uh powerpoint which might give you three or four PowerPoints uh, all around one basic subject. Underneath that, there will be another URL, which might take you to a YouTube video of a worthy expert or commentator talking about something. Third link might take you to a website um, pertinent, such as, for example, Be Well was all about mental health. So it might be Mind or the National Health or all sorts of different websites you could use. Uh, and then that we would... And then it might be TED Talks as well, to be fair. And then what would happen was 
once somebody had done their period of learning, we would set up a, a link um, off one of the platforms and we quickly gravitated to Zoom because it was much more user-friendly, because it was much more flexible, because it wasn't quite as reliant as some other ones on their authentication and certification. Very much open source and it was free uh, initially when we were starting it and then we realised it will paying for a license would be much better because it expanded the 40 minutes, it allowed more people and it gave you slightly more workabilities. So we then set up a meeting where we could discuss what they'd learned. We'd go through those PowerPoints uh, and reinforce that learning. We'd talk about the videos we'd looked at, um, but we could also start to explore much more stuff. And that's where it moved from just being a trainer to a facilitator. And to be able to do that and mentor as well in lots of ways, because the most important word in the English language for me is why. And then you could use lots of whys. When people made a statement, you could then say, well, why do you think that? What brought you to that conclusion? Why did you get there? Best thing about it for me was two screens. And when I discovered that I could split screens, it meant I could share a PowerPoint on here. I could look at somebody's face, look at the person I was particularly interacting with. But over here, I've got a picture of everybody else. So you can keep an eye on them. You can keep an eye for people waving and saying, I need to say something. I need to say something. Um, and, and again, that was another challenge, sorting out that etiquette of what and when you say when you're online, can you just jump in, do you talk over one another, or do you wait patiently like you're in school? So there's loads of stuff that had to be learned while we did it. But one of the big things about that that made a huge difference was the fact that the Be Well project um, had partners across the Erasmus Plus empire that included the UK. It included Ireland, included Spain, it included Turkey, included uh, Greece, and it included Slovenia. And all of the people are brilliant at speaking English, pretty much. But one of the things that helped with this was, one, there was a lot of technical language. Um, so because they were learning remotely at their own speed, it mean they could go away and translate stuff. They could use Google Translate or whatever they wanted to use to figure out what this actually meant and then come back and discuss it once they got their head around the definitions that we wanted to talk about. And we created a whole load of definitions so we're all talking about the same thing. We all knew what bipolar disorder meant. We all knew what PTSD meant, whatever. So that was one of the huge advantages of it. People could work at their own speed, then come back and discuss it. And how we set up the assessment was by a recorded one-to-one -one discussion. And even that we're allowed to play with because I had, could create a form that had tick boxes. So uh, mental health for Stu means this, 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 or this. Which would your answer be? Okay, I'll put a tick in there. Because I was sharing the screen, they could see their answers being updated as we went. And I could also have them on this screen as well. Uh, and then we might have open response stuff. So I could type in some of their answers and pick out the key points of it. And they could see that happening and they could revise that and play around with it exactly as you would uh, if you've got a pencil there and you're writing it down and you rub it out and start the game. So that was really advantageous because it was being recorded. It gave you that formality of a proper examination. Um, but it also meant that you could see what was going on almost in their heads because one of the things that happens really, really quickly, the human species is phenomenally adaptable and people adapted really quickly to seeing themselves on the screen, seeing somebody else there, and they started to ignore it really quickly and just talk. In the same way, when you walk into a classroom, very quickly that relationship takes over and the interactions start to work. So that hybrid way of pulling everything together sort of requires on a lot of flexibility. Um, you need to be able to 
challenge people with what you're teaching them, what you're discussing with them, the the presentations or the media that you use needs to be fairly accessible. But it also becomes really, really important that you have that second screen where you can see people's reactions as you would in a classroom when you're looking around and you see the people who are getting lazy, who are switching off, who are beginning to droop because they've not had a coffee or they had a big lunch. Um, so you could keep an eye on all that stuff going on and then zoom in on people. You had the chat function. So if somebody was starting to fail, you could say, you okay? Uh, and nobody needed to know, or you could send it to everyone and embarrass them. So there was loads of things that you could play around with, which made it work really, really well. But I would have to say um, it took me a while to get there. So can I just take you back to um, your experience through uh, transitioning to, um, to online training when COVID-19 mm. occurred? Yeah, so um, we had a little office in the centre of Norwich, which was part of a charitable foundation, uh, and we had a really good deal where I trained their staff and they gave me free rooms. Um, on March the 17th, uh, we walked out of there the weekend and said, well, I'll see you next week, uh, and never went back. Uh, and it was like, oh, this has happened. <coughs> Our business at the time consisted of assessing people doing apprenticeships, primarily within hospitality, a lot of hospitality training, including things like first aid. Um, and obviously, you weren't allowed to breathe in dummies. You weren't allowed to get close enough to do chest compressions or any of that stuff. So that all disappeared. Health safety, food safety, and the complete lockdown. Man, my business went down the tubes. My business had been running for 15, 20 years, and it just disappeared literally overnight when the government said, yes, we're quite a long way behind Europe, but we're going to lock down now, um, which we sort of knew was coming because – Within the small project, we made some friends in Sicily and I'd spoken to them to see how they were. And they said it was fine, but now it's got really bad because every family from northern Italy, Italy has come to escape to the island and infected the whole of Sicily. So you, there was all that stuff going on and it just started literally surfing the internet trying to figure out what we could do. Um, some people were slightly geared up for it but accelerated. They had bits of e-learning as a subsection of their main business, one of the auditing bodies, but it wasn't very big. It wasn't very special. Um, and they started chucking resources as that. So we started disappearing with that. Worked with a big district in London, uh, and they wanted to give people something to do. Uh, so we were able to do a lot of the e-learning with that. And as that changed, we realized that, People were doing the e-learning. I knew this because I could get a report that says they've done 100% of it and they've been issued a certificate of attendance. But did they actually learn anything? And that's where we started asking the questions. So what we just introduced was, okay, this is the way it's going to happen. You do this, tell me when you get there, and then before you do the final test, we will have a meeting over Zoom where we can talk about anything while you're going through write down words that you don't understand or the way things come together. For example, if you're doing health and safety, what does constitute a risk? What is a hazard? And we can talk about that, how it works. And it became really important that these discussions were much more important than the learning that was going on through the e-learning stuff uh, and starting to pull that together because you could have, lots of people on the screen at the same time in the same way as you would have in a classroom, you could have that interaction. And I became quite happy to just let people talk to one another because they could see one another. Uh, and then as you would do, you facilitate that. As long as you set, okay, don't shout over one another, but again, you could just mute everybody. Right. The reason you've all gone quiet is because I've turned you off because you're giving me a headache. Right. Now, Kevin, what were you saying? Peter, where do you need to go with it? And so you could manage it in the same way you did in the classroom. But because it was so much more intimate in lots of ways, um, 
you suddenly found you could pull people in. Uh, as they say, they forgot about the classroom itself. They forgot about the Zoom environment and the artificiality of it and just started talking. So we started developing a lot of this. As I say, the Be Well project, we had to do it because there was all this Erasmus funding money. We didn't know when it was going to disappear. Um, it was probably going to be our last project in Europe because we were coming out of Europe anyhow because of Brexit and all the idiocy around that. So everybody was quite adaptable. One of the big things that we noticed, and I'm sure you noticed it as well, is the phenomenal adaptability, creativity, flexibility that suddenly came to the fore during the pandemic when people locked down. One of the best things I saw in the pandemic was a concert from Milan Cathedral with a blind singer stood on his own. It's a phenomenal concert uh, when Bajelli did it. And all the stuff that changed um, and the way we started teaching changed. Education had to keep going. We were blessed with a director of the education system who didn't know what he was doing and was making it up. And this cascaded right down throughout the educational system. I don't know if it was the same with you, but different places reacted at different speeds. The private institutions, places like Eton or private schools, reacted really, really quickly because they got the funding and they got the money and they could have one person who made the direction. The public schools were much, much slower because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the resources. And also they had a board of governors who, again, not being educationalists, didn't really know what was going either. Um, and then other colleges, certainly higher education, reacted really, really quickly. It was compounded by the fact that nobody was making chips to go into computers. So nobody was making laptops anymore or computers. Lots of the laptops that were available were old steam-driven ones. And there were always as with logistics in the wrong place at the wrong time. So getting people online became really, really challenging, really, really difficult. And you might have, and I know certainly I encountered it, one family at the lower end of the economic scale, the mum had a fairly old smartphone, but that smartphone had to do the online learning for a 20-year-old in college, a 16, 17-year-old doing um their A levels, a child at uh, high school, just starting high school, or even e learning for primary school kids, where Miss would get them all online, join a giraffe. And so everybody was changing phenomenally quickly. And there was brilliant solutions. There was brilliant solutions all the time coming through. So a lot of my time was spent literally just surfing, going to the rabbit hole that is the blue link of a hyper and, and seeing where it took me and looking at how other people were doing things, what we could do. Uh, and one of the best things I think I did was stopping and looking back at what we were doing and trying to look at not what I was talking about, but what people were receiving and that chain of communication um, and all the blocks that were there. One of the things that became quite important was uh, with the other project, Bev Tour, which was about beverage tourism right across Europe. And that was a big project. I had 11 or 12 partners across it. Um, so with the ones we talked about, we had Slovakia, we had um, France, we had Portugal as well. Um, we had to manage that online using meetings. So that was a big Zoom call with everybody in. Um, but we ran it exactly the same way we would run a normal meeting in the, we'd create an agenda which we sent out in advance. We opened everything up. We recorded every meeting. So, oh, the Italians as well. We recorded every meeting so people could go, go back and listen. One of the new innovations, and this is sure how you got to keep up with it. If you use Microsoft Teams, which lots of people have access to because it comes with their Microsoft Office product, when you hit the record button, it will also give you a transcript as well. And that is highly entertaining because it's not very good at recognizing accents. 
Um, I often come up as Marie, which is fine. I'm secure in my own sexuality. But all that stuff goes on, and it means that people can go through the recording bit by bit. The way the transcription works is if you're just reading it through and you click on it, it takes you to that bit in the recording. Really, really smart, that bit. Uh, I don't know, and I've not used Zoom to see whether it'll do that or not, but that bit of Microsoft Teams is fantastic. There's other downsides. It's not quite as flexible. But learning how to use those and manage those became really, really important. And it meant that we could map the agenda to the subjects we wanted to talk about. So all 11 of the countries, 12 of the countries, could actually keep up to date with stuff. So when we then sent the minutes out following the meeting, they knew where we were and they could go back to it and they could go back to the recording, revisit that recording and refresh themselves on what we were talking about. When we moved on to the actual training itself, um, the same thing happened. Again, just adapting the way it worked became quite important. But that second screen, again, is important, was amplified in that you were able to see what was going on in people's faces. You could see their eyebrows raised. You could see their eyeballs cross. You could see them instantly switch off. And, oh. While they tried to work it out or they just gave up in trying to understand it at all. And you can then zoom in on that. And again, you could use the, the keyboard to actually say, are you with me? Do we need to go back over that or whatever? And you could encourage people, depending on the group that you had, to interject when you needed them to, because you had that time. It's quite easy to stop it. One of the great things about Zoom is that you can pause the recording. Yeah. So you could stop that recording, explain to someone so they didn't have it all over the internet, take them through it nice and slow and say, okay, you're happy. Yes, right, we're going to restart the recording. But it gives everybody a chance to turn off and have a break as well whilst you're doing that. So it gives you a massive amount of flexibility. You can be creative how you can share things, um, which brings me to it. One of the things I want to share with you, uh, simply just to show you how far we have come from, and I can share the sound as well, is this one. This is where it was. Have you seen this? Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it perfect. Okay. So this was the Open University stuff. You know that the area of this circle is pi times the radius squared. But why is the formula pi r squared? And how could you prove it? Well, by the end of the programme, you'll have a way of doing it. Let's start by reminding ourselves what pi is. It's been known for thousands of years that the ratio between the circumference of a circle and its diameter is a constant. And that's the constant pi in the formula for the area. So that's how it used to be. Open University started in the 70s then the TV programmes used to come out. The problems that I have with that was, I'm sure she's very sweet, I understand the circle. How have we known it for thousands of years? What is a constant? And they created so many questions that you can't ask, but you could type in the chat, what's a constant? How have we known for thousands of years? Or somebody could say, excuse me, why, how? And you've still got that interactivity. What you can do is you can go, okay, ping drop a hyperlink in and say, go and have a look at this. In your own time, give me a shout if you need me to explain it through. Or you can say, okay, let's find another video. Ping, does anybody else want to join in? So it becomes a complete two-way, three-way, 50-way educational experience. You mentioned when we spoke about um, collaboration, um, you mentioned cultural awareness and inclusive learning environment yeah in a long about way but can you explain to me how would you make your environment inclusive to all of your learners in particular when you're online or hybrid teaching okay i think lots of teaching 
Uh, I mean, it's, it, teachers have a style. Some mm -hmm. are very formal, work their way through. Others are very sort of free form, which is sort of me, really, I suppose. Um, people with an administration or uh, an engineering background tend to work through very much through a process, one by one by one. Uh, the more creative people tend to make these leaps, and that's how the world works. What I used to find is if I'm going to do a session, or no, okay, what I did find, because um, there was a few hiccups along the way, was that you need to think about where you're going in the same way. If you're going into a classroom, you would have a lesson plan. You'd know what you were going, and that's what I use a PowerPoint for. So I can go off piece, but that will bring me back to, to where I need to go and the message I need to get across. So that preparation becomes really important. You need to think about your audience. If you're just doing something that is just going to be broadcast, it's going to be stuck up on YouTube on a channel or something like that, then you just do it. Um, and it's down to everybody else to try and figure out what you're talking about, really, I suppose. When you're doing a teaching session, um, teaching only works if people are engaged. You know, otherwise, I'm just telling you stuff but none of it will be absorbed, none of it will be taken in, and none of it will probably engage you. So you need to think about your audience, and that becomes really, really important. Then you need to think about the best way of getting your message across. That's fine. But it's all the preparation, because what happens as soon as it sort of goes live is that you need to engage people. And if you are reading notes, if you are reading off a PowerPoint, they're not going to be engaged. You've got to be able to look at it. You still need to make that eye contact that you do in a classroom. You still need that second screen to be able to see what's going on with everybody else. You need to be very, very, very much aware. Okay, if it's with a communication, 7% words, 35% tone of voice, 50% body language, then only change on the telephone call conversation to 40% words. The rest of it is your tone of voice because they don't see the body language, except they do. They hear it. If you want to make a phone call to someone and have a rant and rave, stand up to do it. Pace around because that changes the way your lungs work, your throat works, so the air going across your vocal cords, change the way your voice sounds, and our brains are hard wired to pick it up. So the body language when you're talking to someone is really, really important. What would you um, think a good facilitator needs? Whether, like, what do, do they say to enable a classroom to um, feel inclusive? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> can I just let you into a secret, Carol? Yeah. I'm making this up along as I go along. That's and, okay. And, <laughs> and every classroom that I do is very much like that because you've got to react to the people I see. Quite often, if I'm doing a physical assessment of someone, you know, I will say, I can't tell you where my answers are going to go or what they're going to be mm -hmm. because I don't know what your answers are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I need to react to, which is why – which is the reason that the word why is so important. I will say to people and set those parameters, okay, you might say things that are really, really important to what I need to learn. So I might go, whoa, stop, stop, stop. Let's just go back one sentence. What does that mean? And get people to explain it. It, it shows, it reinforces that positivity. It shows that you're actually were listening and that you are interested in what they say. And that becomes really, really important. Um, and you need to be able to do that with everyone. So that eye that's on the screen over here, you need to be able to see when somebody's eyeballs cross or they just give you those little signals that says, mm, yeah, I don't know if I believe that. Then you can question them. So in the same way as you would in a classroom, that observation skills become really important. And that's fine because that's how we communicate. Everything is about the observation and watching what's going on. So once you start getting your head around the fact that whilst they're still on a the screen, they are still three-dimensional people, 
then it becomes a lot easier. You need to be confident. You need to believe that you sort of know what you're talking about, or at least as far as your agenda is concerned, you know what you're talking about. Um, but you need to be open to other people's opinions as well. So you need that creativity, that flexibility, that adaptability, which is a sub that came out phenomenally as the, um, the pandemic kicked in. And in the same way, in so many different ways of life, people were just doing things differently. And all the old processes suddenly got shaken up. And this is just merely one of those processes. You need to be brave, though. Mm -hmm. You need to be brave. You need to sort of ask questions of yourself and of your candidates so it does draw them in. So as a trainer, um, when you work online, whether it be hybrid, e-learning, yep. whatever way you want to name it, or whether you work in the in-house classroom environment, what is the one thing the trainer needs towards their learners? Um, I think you were hitting on, on it. Would it be empathy? Like, how do you still reconnect or connect with your learners if they're on a screen and in the classroom? Can you manage both together? And you yeah, I think still be the like same people. trainer as you, you've always yeah. been. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's really important that you are who you are mm -hmm. and you work how you work um, because nearly all the same things apply. I think possibly you need to have a little bit more awareness when you're um, remote, when you're online, mm -hmm. uh, because the signals are different. You don't mm -hmm. get... Or the, you might not see somebody cross their arms and go away, but you would see somebody going, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all those little signals that you pick up in the classroom that you can still pick up on here, but you're only seeing this much. Sorry, this much. Um, so you need to be aware of that. But I think in the same way as you do in the classroom, you've got to realise, and it's a real pain, but you've got to realise, understand, and get on board with the fact that everybody's different and everybody reacts differently. And whilst you can look at demographics and say, okay, all those sort of people do that sort of thing, engineers will always be boring people because they just work a process. Um, but some of them aren't. And some of them are really exciting people. So you need to be able to click into people straight away. And I really think to be any sort of a teacher, you've got to like people. And I really mm -hmm. think 98% of people are fantastic. There are 2% of people who you just don't want to know, but 98% of people are fabulous. But every one of those people has got a button, and you need to find that button. And that's whether you're teaching or you're just communicating, or you're trying to go out for a drink with them, you need to find that button. That becomes really, really important. And I think for a teacher, whether it is online or offline, you still need to find that button. How do we make that connection between your virtual person, which is your virtual learner, and your real <laughs> live learner sitting in the classroom? How, as a trainer, how do we make the connection work really well um, when we're teaching in that situation? Because you're you. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's really that simple. Don't okay. You keep saying virtual learner. They're not virtual <laughs> learners. They're people in a virtual environment. Yeah. They're just not here. And it the where it clicked for me was where I realised. It really doesn't matter. I will go and watch a film on the TV um, and I'll get hugely involved in it and I will suspend my disbelief for a little while because I'm just looking at these two-dimensional Im images. I'm still looking at two-dimensional images, but they're three-dimensional people. And I think it becomes massively important that you just say, okay, I understand this is a little bit weird, but don't worry about it. Just talk to me. And 
if you don't worry about it, people tend not to. People tend to just adapt really, really quickly. People forget that they're on telly because it doesn't feel like telly because there's all this two-way stuff going on, whereas on telly, it tends to be one way. So the change becomes in you've done the preparation, you sort of know where you want to go, you are brave enough to let it go where it does go, um, but in the same way, in a classroom, you don't, you're never aggressive, but sometimes you'd be assertive because you've got to control them. We did when we decided we needed to go online. Was I drew up a, a sort of etiquette list of how you need to handle yourself, and you still need to do that. This needs to be interactive, but remember that other people might be speaking. Remember there is this delay, so don't talk over people. Just put your hand up. And now you can put a little button up, which will wave a little yellow hand. How can we improve, um, I suppose, our existing knowledge and practices and implement it into a hybrid model of, I suppose, teaching? I think, I don't know if you did it. When I do it, as I'm, everybody's gone, I'm collecting up the papers and I'm putting the pencils back in the bag and I'm mm -hmm. waiting for my laptop to turn off. I'm thinking, what went wrong in that? Or that was a really exciting session. I really enjoyed that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm lucky because lots of times I will deliver with my business partner and we'll talk about it on the way back, what went right, what went wrong. Um, and that becomes really, really important, that learning experience. Going forward, is there anything that you believe may make the transition for a training company or training organisation or trainer make the transition that bit easier to actually go and teach a hybrid class? Or yeah, I think it's don't be afraid of it. Um, mm -hmm. Come out of the COVID pandemic now, but we still use a lot of the lessons that we learned during that. For example, um, first aid, if sometimes with a business, it can be really difficult to take 10 people out of a business to do a day's training because you've got to shut the business down quite often. So again, we use that e-learning bit, but then what we do is we'll send out a link that says, we are going to be here and I'll be sat doing office work doing admin and something like that, but with an open Zoom link. And all of a sudden it goes bing bong and somebody pops up, Murray, mate, can I just ask you a quick question about this? And we'll start this conversation. And before you know it, somebody else has popped in because you get a notification saying Carol's joined the meeting. And so they come in to see what Carol's got to say. And you share that learning experience straight away. And it's completely informal. And it's a little bit like a, a tutor session in a university where mm -hmm. he sat there in his room with all his books around him but he pours a cup of tea and you sit down and have a chat um so we use that quite a lot and then what we'll do we'll pull them together in a physical way but only for an hour to do the formal examination so they get the full proper certificate because it's invigilated the first two meetings of be well um we actually ended up having six meetings instead of two meetings because we could do them all online and it meant we could keep in touch with people much better than we could have done if you've got, like with BevTor, 11 companies, 11 countries all flying to Tallinn and, you know, at ginormous cost or all flying to Catania in Sicily. Um, we could have those Zoom meetings that went on constantly, but we had six formal ones, I think, but we had lots of little interactions as well. And, it was much closer. So when in year two of the project, we did all get together, it was massive hugs all around because we all knew one another. Um, and it was really, really friendly. And when we did the report, and this is really important for this project as well, when we did the report for the UK agency, you know, one of the questions on one of the things we addressed was, was it okay not having um, those meetings going on? 
And it was, yeah, do you know what? It really was because we had this and it saved an awful lot of money. But, and this is the crucial bit, what happens when you have a physical meeting is not what goes on in the meeting because that was the same. It's where you go out and have dinner afterwards and you're walking around the town together and you're talking to these. A hybrid education um, is fast emerging. Is it here to stay? Absolutely. Okay, in some form. The, the the trouble is, when you look at the way we are changing now, advancing new techniques, um, it's it's absolutely astonishing. So how it will finish up, I don't know. But I don't think it's just hybrid education. I think hybrid working is here to stay. You know, virtual offices abound um, and have done for a long time. Why do we need to stick everybody in their huge, great building and eat that when they can work at home? We know categorically that it is more productive we know clearly that people react much better a lot of the time to being in their own familiar environment and having that flexibility that's why flexi time works we know that you can achieve an awful lot more you can disseminate information much quickly um we can have a virtual meeting with a lot of people quickly, instantaneously, and then say, okay, that's it. Thanks, guys. Bang, gone. You get on with your life. So that bit is there. But we also now know that it is still intensely personal. It can still be phenomenally creative. When you think of what you can do with, with a pen, you can draw stuff on Zoom now here. We've got a whiteboard. I could write on it, and you can annotate it from your end. It's that instant. It's that fantastic. So there is that two-way interaction or 50-way interaction. You need to work to your own parameters. You know, if you feel comfortable with 10 people, 10 people's fine because you can do another one an hour later. So do it that way because it maintains that intimacy. You don't have to do it for 100 people unless you don't want them to react. You just want to blast it out there. But again, that works brilliantly as well. So whether you are recording to the stockholders your company results for GKN or Shell or BP or whatever, whether you are trying to address the whole of your nation, are you just going to put it out there and you have a few representatives or whether it's a one-to-one -one thing that needs to be intimate where you can go wherever you want, this is here to stay. And as our broadband speeds get better, the connectivity gets better, the, the chips in our laptops work faster so you don't get that hanging, you can multitask all sorts of things, it's here to stay. It's not going away. What you need to remember is the person on the other side of the screen is still a human being. So you're 25 years um, training. Which uh, type of training do you prefer? In-house training, online training, or a mix of both? Sometimes I don't want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to drive 500 miles to go and see someone mm -hmm. where I can get it over and done within an hour, get the paperwork done within an hour, and it's done and done and done. But I have to say, if you get a room full of people and it works, and that doesn't matter whether it's on a screen or not, it's a fantastic feeling. And when you do an assessment with somebody and they perform out of their skin and you know part of it is because of what you've taught them or the information that you've pulled out of them, I get really excited about it. Um Meeting people I get really excited about, and it really doesn't matter. So the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you, Murray, for all of your wonderful information and, again, for um, participating with your time. and We really appreciate it.